Hi, and welcome to another Intrapreneur Stories. I'm Afonso from Bundle, but this is not about Bundle. This is about the great entrepreneurs who have made it. That is, they built ventures from within, and they have a lot of learnings to share with us. Today is a special episode for two reasons. First one is, this is our 12th episode and the last one of this year, 2018. Stay tuned for more. But it's equally special because I'm interviewing Hugo Pinto. Or in Portuguese, like myself, Hugo Pinto. We met in London a few months ago and I was sure Hugo was an entrepreneur and it turns out he is. He's gonna to introduce to us the venture that he built at Telefonica Digital. Now, there's three reasons why I want you to stay tuned and listen to this story. The first one is, the insight came about when Hugo was performing his current role at Telefonica. Second, it is today an established business at Telefonica. And three, the journey seems fascinating because in his words, he was looking he was like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat, and guess what? The cat wasn't even there. I have no idea what that means, but it's gotten me really, really keen on wanting to know more about this story. So I'm gonna put my headphones on and get chatting to Hugo, who's calling in from London today. Hugo, hi. Hey. <laughs> How are Good you? Good to be here. I'm glad, I'm glad we're talking about this. Now, I understand that today you were managing director of Accenture Digital. You are a startup mentor startup advisor, and a plethora of roles, but today we're focusing on this specific corporate venture that you built, mm -hmm. the blind man in the dark room. Tell us a little bit more about, A, what role were you doing? What was that insight? What is that business? And how was this journey difficult or challenging, but you came through on the other side of that dark room? Yeah, my, my pleasure. Um, after a lot of bumps in my head, by the way. But... Um, so it, it, it was it was interesting because I, I was um, at Telefonica Digital and I was um, uh, in charge of, of digital internal digital communications platform etc. And um, Telefonica Digital became this um, sort of a monster entrepreneur entrepreneur actually with 13 businesses uh, spinning off of the mothership and trying to build these new business models right and. Um, uh, as I was, uh, as I sort of engaged with all of those stakeholders and started talking about their challenges, what they were doing, uh, I sort of started bringing in different ways of thinking into the conversation. And at some stage, uh, I really um, uh, grew fascinated with the data monetization business. So that's essentially the telco data. It, it, there's a lot of value in that uh, for businesses and, and no privacy issues involved, but Actually, the patterns of, of movement, the density of people in different times of day as, as a whole group has tremendous impact and value in terms of transportation, in terms of uh, what are the services that uh, you can provide and how can you optimize your own operation for businesses. And uh, because I'd worked in a number of, of sectors before, I sort of got talking to the, the so a couple of people in the leadership of that business. And they thought, well, actually, Hugo, we're looking for someone to help us build a go-to-market strategy and a team that can help us communicate what you just helped us define across different cultures. And that was the, the sort of way in. It was the fact that I was Portuguese, had lived in Spain and worked with Latin America quite a lot, also worked with uh, Nordic countries and in the UK more specifically. And um, I think the skill set that they saw, that they saw, apart from the fact that uh, I had a lot of experience in digital businesses and uh, entrepreneurship, was actually being able to decodify and understand what are the nuances of all of those cultures and how does something a bit controversial and a bit risky like this of monetizing data, of applying things like um, uh, AI and, and at the time a lot of um, uh, smart analytics to make a difference for other businesses was different than selling SIM cards and getting people on their uh, phone contracts. So I absolutely loved it. Um, to give a bit of background, I think one of the things that characterizes me as um, um, a team member is I have probably 
uh, 90% of my energy dedicated to my day job. And then I always find adventures to sort of sink my teeth into. And if they're not there, I'll make them up, uh, <laughs> which is not always the best thing. But it, it actually really helps in, um, in finding these opportunities within the places where I work. And I think that's how it started. It started with a vision uh, that they had that was really good. Um, and uh, that's how they invited me into the first dark room. Right, and the cat was only like in the third or the fourth room. But uh... okay, so break this down. We gotta, we gotta, I gotta try to understand this. So you were able, so Telefonica, huge company, massive footprint. I don't know if at the time it was in fourteen or seventeen markets globally. Um, you were head of internet and social, and something is getting lost in translation from a data monetization point of view from country to country because of cultural nuances, yeah. and. With this, you thought, I'm going to correct this. Am, am, I, on, am I on par with where yeah, we're supposed to Yeah, it was almost here? like a coming together of, they were looking for someone to actually help them um, build the message and what is the value proposition and how do we take it to market? And how does this fit then with the local teams and the local um, legacy businesses? Because Telefonica or every telco has their own operation based on their infrastructure in the different countries. So they need to find a way to build an operating model to roll out these new products in a way that it, it actually fits with their local operations. And, um, and that's where we saw the fit. Great. And so you become a pilot business unit at this point, saying we have a mandate, a vision, and now we got to roll this out or test it. Product. Yeah, a product. Yeah. Okay. And what, what was this called? And uh, what was the next steps then on growing this, the footprint? What were the hurdles to getting to the end? Oh, there, oh, plenty of hurdles. I think um, there were a few of them. Some of them generated by the fact that you're building something new. Uh, so you don't quite know what the product is, right? As I'm pretty sure that when Zuckerberg started Facebook, he didn't know the users were the product. He thought that the, the, the platform or the site was the product. Um, but I think the key thing here is until you actually uncover where the, the value is, where that killer app for your product is, and who's going to actually buy it, and how they're going to use it, you can't really understand how much value it's going to generate. So I think the business was in this mode in which it had a lot of clever people from different industries that knew there was tons of value. And this is 2012, when there were a lot of sentences coming out saying things like, data is the new oil, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we're talking about people that were really looking ahead of of what was being done back then. And um, I remember they brought in uh, Sandy Penton from the MIT. And, and we, whenever he came into the, the meetings, you were like, whoa, OK, let me just take a few days to process all of that and then understand how that has just changed my whole existence. And then how does that help me do something productive? Because I just got lost. Right. And um, we started realizing that. This was, this was the potential. The problem was when you're trying to then fit this as a product in the hands of someone that has a day job that they've learned to do over the course of tens of years, it's very difficult to get them to change the way they do things to incorporate your product. Even if it allows them to save um, uh, 50% of their time or uh, reduce the amount of steps they have to do so they can actually complete what their uh, job description is. So ultimately, it's, it's about the, the, the human barrier was probably the biggest one. And this was the external one, right? Really finding users that you can take insights from. Uh, the advantage there is obviously being an entrepreneur and taking on the question that you asked at the beginning. This is the first bit of the answer is you actually have access to some of those users because when you're starting a business within a big business, you already have clients, channels, relationships you can leverage, which is typically one of the things startups look for, right? It's clients, channels to actually test and take their products to. I would take the, the second barrier and, and, and the, 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 the biggest one in par with this one is internally convincing the people that have also been doing a job for the last 20, 30 years and are the experts in their field to actually open an exception and allow you to try something that somehow changes what they do, right? 
um, and if you think about big businesses, everyone is very busy. Everyone is sort of steaming ahead at 120, 130% of their time. So if you ask them, it's just 5%. And that's where this barrier manifests. And the key for it is you have to find the people that have that internal drive, that internal entrepreneurial voice that still tells them, this is so cool. This has such a big impact. And I want to be a part of it. And when you find those people, actually, you break down that second barrier and you've created almost like an internal ecosystem and network that start becoming your sounding board. And suddenly, when you want to know, how do I phrase this? You have two people that you can go to and they'll say, you know, this for this market is done like this. This is called like that into that market. So, again, it's another human problem. It's creating that network. And... um I think the final barrier is you need to have a product that works, right? Um, and um, I, I think there we have something that produced the insights that um, were useful. I'm not sure the way that those were being translated into a product was actually the best way. And I think those were the rules, right? It's still you're just looking for the same people, the same pattern, but you might not be um, uh, telling the right message and the right story to get there. So I would say these are the three key uh, barriers. Mm. And and so looking back at the project and you said, okay, we got to room one. Um, in room one, what was the product? Mm -hmm. And what was that room like before you moved to room two? Um, I think that first one was about a product. It was about a platform, right? So it, it was a little bit like those entrepreneurs that create this really great technological solution and then go find a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, um, what we did with that room is there was um, there was a VP of innovation, Chris, amazing guy, um, and uh, Juan, a uh, Spanish guy. So Spanish guy, Portuguese guy, and a uh, uh, Canadian that lives in America. It's the beginning of a joke, right? And the three of us sort of start plotting and we're like, yes, but, you know, if we use this for this purpose and stuff like uh, helping sort out the location of ambulances, where would they be better located to improve the response time to any incident? Or uh, how do you justify the decision of closing down fire stations in London? These types of things were the fascinating ones because those were inequivocal proof of the value of it. So we go off on this innovation rampage and we sort of start taking these ideas and we then had Juana, the data scientist, crazy head of data science that sort of did everything and he did the data science and the website and the demo and the video and he came to the pitch and we start talking to all of these people and suddenly you start uncovering nuggets and the biggest nugget of all is it's not really about the platform. It's about the insights you can get through the platform. But some people will not add a new tool to the suit of tools that they already use to do their job. So it's how can you create those insights, make those insights available without forcing them to go through a tool, right? That gets us into room two, which is what are the services and how do okay. you shape those services? Okay, so now you're room two, you're shaping the services, you're understanding that there is a back engine of all this great data, but that's not what the users are looking for. They're looking for actionable insights. Yeah. So at this point in room two, now you understand the user validation and you look for more validation, right, um, of people who would adopt this. And at this point, what, what is the product called at this point? Is it a working name? Is it a... a... Uh, Dynamic Insights, I think. I think that was Dynamic. from the beginning. The, the, the company was called Telefonica Dynamic Insights. I think the first product, which I think came out of room two, because it's already a hybrid between platform, which was still useful to actually host data models and uh, services. It was called Smart Steps, right? And steps to translate the, 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 the sort of patterns of movement within cities, commute patterns, et cetera, et cetera. And then how do those release intelligence for businesses to then make that better decisions, right? Uh, that was the first, that was the first sort of denomination of product. There were other products as well. Um, but that was sort of the core product and the one that then got us into the, the second, uh, testing ground. And if we're now in room two, 
Um, and we now have a commercial relationship with clients. We're actually starting to get some revenue in. We're actually starting to build a sales force. Um, and, um, and now again, as I start engaging with, with those guys that have actually been providing a lot of data services to a lot of our customer profiles, they all start bringing in insights like, well, you know, but this doesn't happen in isolation. So what are the other things that we can mix? And suddenly it's not about the insights generated by us. It's about the insights generated by us along with other data sources and in a, a slightly different context. So it opens up for me what is the biggest cultural barrier of large organizations, which is any business model in the future does not happen self-contained. There is no one company that is going uh, to own everything. There are companies that are going to orchestrate the right points of, of value and then be able to uh, articulate them properly to users or customers. And I think that was the big realization that then gets you out of room two and into three or four different rooms. Because now the rooms are actually have a cat, but now you need to find and grab that cat. And then you need to find the light switch to actually understand what is this and what do I do with it. Um, and I guess at that stage is when I, sort of, I then left and I, I then joined IBM after that. Um, but funnily enough, before the product launch that we did was in, um, in partnership with the Open Data Institute that gave us that expanded lens around what is the other relevant information to know what comes before our value bit and what comes after we've done our value um, uh, bit. And uh, with, with companies like IBM to bring in different lenses and different minds to actually figure out is there something we're missing? Because we're just a group of, and at the time, I think there were a hundred, a hundred of us. So it, it had grown from 30 people to a hundred people. And still it's not big enough for you to actually see all of the potential avenues where that idea can take you to. Because I think the problem with being an entrepreneur versus an entrepreneur is you create this tunnel vision and you start ruling out possibilities because, oh, that's too much far away of our comfort zone. So it's going to be difficult to get the company to actually uh, do this. And, and I mean, what was really grand in all of this is the, the whole team was working together to this. And there was a constant communication and, and Steve, the, 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 the lead of this initiative, constantly did, Hugo, we need to do a whole hands call. Let's get everyone, let's share what's happened. And this happened here, can't happen there. And... Um, it was really interesting because I think what Telefonica did, and some initiatives went better, some went not as well, um, I think was that they proved that whenever you get people with the right ideas, working in the right operating model and mindset, um, with access to all of the assets that, the, that these companies still have, and now I'm talking about telcos, uh, auto companies, energy companies, they still have a lot of valuable information, but they need to open up and they need to start bringing or creating these teams that have a little bit of free range to actually go out and experiment. Um, the learnings of, of that experience were, were tremendous, right? And if I had uh, a big background in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, I started a digital agency back in Portugal, Exido, and um, I helped spin off a couple of, of business models out in, in MTV. Um, I think that one added, wow, this, this is the potential of data and technology together reinventing what the role of these big organizations are. And that definitely changed my perspective of when I walked into IBM of what, what my job was going to be. Okay. And um, I want to just um, kind of wrap up this great venture that you were part of building. And was it called Smart Steps in the end? The product? Was, yeah. Still there, yeah. It's smart steps. And is it a B2B facing channel? Yes, B2B. Yes. So correct me. So after hearing you, you know, my mind is floating around. Let's say I have a corner <laughs> shop and I know that commuters will stop and buy water every day at 8 a.m. You provide me a data of how many commuters are passing through my corner shop and how much water I should have to sell to them. But what if, in addition to this, trains 
don't come in that day or there's a strike and what are the data implications to my business? Or there's a heat wave. Or there's a heat wave. So this is what I'm thinking, right? And that's what you did. <laughs> that's Amazing, exactly fascinating, it. So, smart so think steps. about um, at what time do I open in different days of the week? Uh, what are the products that I put on the, on the window of my shop that are going to have the biggest impact that day? Um, how do specific events affect uh, my business and how do I plan for it? So there's, and even how do I open up? Sorry, I'm just going to turn the lights on again, probably, or not. Um, You're still there. How, fine. I'm still there. And uh, how do they um, enable businesses to do the best decisions data-backed decisions around even where do I open my next shop, right? Because yeah. is it on one side of the station, on the other side of the station? And, and the, the sort of dodgy threshold you need to get across is like the, 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 ta the taxi driver syndrome, right? Versus Google Maps. And they say, yeah, Google Maps says go there. I, I actually, I know this way is better. So all of the experts in the industry, they are going to say, I know better because I've done this tons of times. Right. So that's the threshold you have to go. You have to be able to tell them one different thing that actually triggers a different outcome to get them convinced. So I think going through the dark rooms, you only let you won't do the, the way you uh, light that switch is when you actually are able to prove this um, to someone in the industry. And after you've done that, I think it's it, it becomes a no brainer and it becomes a clear, a clear opportunity. Cool. And just looking at the more like 50,000 feet overview of this. This was a three-year project, I believe, right? Uh, it took a couple of years. A couple of years. And, and um, <laughs> would, what would you have spent more time doing in terms of building a venture within a corporate? If you, you could go back now, is there anything you would have done a little bit more? I would. Um, I would have formalized those experiments to happen earlier. Uh, I think it, it took us a little bit of time to actually put things in front of, of actual users and clients. And I think if the sooner you do that, the quicker you get the insights that actually detect what those, those killer functionalities are of your product and what the real potential is. Um, definitely that would have been something that I would have done. And funnily enough, that was such an important insight that the, the way that I now help clients build their approach to uh, transformation and digital transformation is exactly that. Don't build a three-year plan. Build a set of experiments you run over the course of a few weeks that give you a sort of a, an in into the playing field to actually feel, well, there's something not right here, or, whoa, this is a much bigger opportunity than I expected. And um, increase incrementally. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket and then, you know, just wait a few months and chicks come out. It doesn't happen like that. Um, the other thing is, and this is very specific uh, to working with data, the sooner you get the end users involved, the quicker you'll get them to actually realize the value and be your mm -hmm. advocate, right? Mm -hmm. That is so important. It's totally different to have to go try and sell an idea to someone than to get them to co-create with you and then it becomes your joint project. I couldn't stress this enough. This is super important. Um, yeah. I think that's that's great, and I want to just ask you two things about entrepreneurship themselves itself, which is the first one and the first question actually comes from Kenny Hendricks from Telenet, who we previously interviewed on the Park, which was actually an initiative between Bundle, uh, where we participated with Kenny on building the Park, um, a Telenet venture, and he's left the question, which is, what makes it different and an advantage? for intrapreneurship versus entrepreneurship. You focus on a few points there, but it'd be great to encapsulate that into an answer if that's okay. Um, I will go back to a uh, marketing theory from uh, Philip Kotler, right? Um, your, your advantages are also your potential threat, which is the fact that you have access to all of that information and all of those customers or users is also your biggest liability because there is risk involved. So to convince people to take risk is actually a big task. Uh, so it comes back to actually spending time with people is the most important thing. And understanding how you can turn 
um, uh, people that don't believe the concept or want to oppose it or resist it into advocates is your biggest weapon. Because if you convince two or three right people and one gives you access to resources, the other one gives you access to infrastructure, the other one gives you access to clients, you have the right ingredients you need to actually go and build the proof that there is something there. And the beauty of when you build proof is, I love this Portuguese sentence, right? Contra factos no argumentos. Against numbers, you can't really argue numbers because numbers are numbers. If once you've proven it, it's just a matter of multiplication or, or, or addition. So um, getting through that, that is the key thing. And that is what you have um, streamlined being a part of a big organization that has a commercial operation running. It's also what makes it the most difficult is convincing those people to be a part of that experiment and, and give, give you their 5% on top of 120. That's great. I mean, I can totally see that you're an optimist and I'm using this to lead into my last question. And I say you're an optimist because you said addition or multiplication. You didn't say subtraction or division. So let's keep going forward and in a growth <laughs> pattern. And that's my last question. And it kind of goes back to how I knew just from meeting you that although, yes, you are at Accenture and you said, and I just knew you were an entrepreneur. So my question is, what makes entrepreneurs stand out? What is this, their skill set or mannerism or the way they navigate within a corporate company that they just stand out, that they're fighting for something, which I wouldn't say is against the grain, but there's something there. Can you kind of just elaborate if you think there are certain skills or just certain pulls of energy that you have that just yeah. differentiate the entrepreneur? I get an analogy. It's a bit like the, the sentence in the matrix that when, uh, when Neo is being tortured by the agent and he says, humans are like a virus, right? Actually, I don't think humans are a virus. I think ideas behave like viruses. So I think you need to be contagious in the way that you tell your ideas. You need to find what is that specific data point that is going to make someone into a believer. And if you're able to empathize with people at that level, they will understand what you're trying to achieve. And even if they don't want to take an active role in it, they will, they will even collaborate or, or just stand aside if they don't want to stand in the way. Um, the, the other one is, um, you just need to talk, 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 communicate, communicate. Over communication is better than no communication or not enough. Uh, and, and I think, that enables you to find it's it's a it's a, an iterative approach. It's a it's a, a, a failure uh, learn through failure. But you have to find the people that have the same mindset and get them aligned into your cause. And um, the third one is actually be focused on the outcome. You have to relentlessly stay focused on on a specific outcome. And what I mean by this is narrow down the thing you're trying to do to the easiest demonstrable outcome that you can use to convince someone that it's real, that it works, right? So priming down your experience. I mean, a good example, right? This product is a global product. Are we going to launch globally just like anyone else? Or are we going to need to spend a lot of money marketing to get users attracted, right? So let's narrow it down to a country. And then for a specific country, does that country have specific traits that make one country more attractive to other are the regions where there's a bigger concentration mm. of those audiences you're chasing and then within those regions are there profiles within those companies that are more susceptible or that get most value out of it and then within that is there a privileged group you have access to so if you narrow it down to that now you have a group of 20 people that you can go and have a coffee with and show them a prototype and get them thinking Oh, oh, wow. If I had this, I could actually do this 10 times faster or I could do this two times more accurately. I want to take this and I want to show it to my boss. And you have a, you have a thing there, right? And I think doing this as often as possible is going to help you navigate and understanding because the other thing about a product is sometimes the user is different from the buyer, right? And this is something that doing B2B business development sort of teaches you. 
you might have a user that sees the immediate value of a product, but unless you can actually articulate it to the different levels that have a decision making in procuring that product, or yeah. even have it fitting the right process to be used, um, it won't get used. So hacking is not just hacking the use of the product. It's hacking, making it really easy to buy, right? Or as I, I'd like to say, difficult to not buy, right? It's mm. so easy, you, you can't not buy, or at least not try. And the, and the trying is the, the other key factor. Once people see something that they really want, they won't let go, right? And uh, for instance, at, at IBM and, and Accenture, I've run a numerous amount of workshops with people. And once the ideas are co-created by them and they own it, they're the ones chasing you. So it totally reverses the, the salesman paradigm of having to chase and having to do a, a very good follow-up work. It, it, it's not required. You have to keep the engine going, right? People will come to you. And that's what happens when you generate network effects is you have an ecosystem of people creating uh, inputs and an, an ecosystem of people demanding output, right? Hugo, I mean, that is the best answer that started with the word contagion <laughs> and ended up with a sprint into passion. Um, I want to thank you because you've left us with a ton of insights, um, smart steps, what it does, what you went through. Um, there are a lot of insights here, and I just want to pull out one that I think is very tangible for any entrepreneur who's watching now, which is don't have a full year plan, you know, have the series of uh, experiments. And uh, on that note of having a coffee, we'll have a beer next week. I'll be in town. And I just want to thank you for uh, coming on Entrepreneur Stories. It was great. Thanks for the invite. It's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to say goodbye to the camera if you can wait for one second. Thank you. So that was Entrepreneur Stories, episode 12. Hugo Pinto, ton of insights, lots to learn here, and I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did, and I feel energized. I feel the contagion. With that in mind, this is the 12th episode and the last one for 2018. We are revamping, rethinking the format. May change, may not, but you know that you can stay tuned. We have podcasts on Anchor. We have the YouTube clips. Just leave us questions, suggestions. We're going to come back with more from Bundle and Entrepreneur Stories shortly to you. Thank you.